Welcome everyone to Slater Pot 29. Hello from Zurich. Hi from London. So I heard you went on a pop crawl. <laughs> I did not go on a pub crawl. No, I went for two very respectable pub lunches on Monday and Tuesday. Pub lunches. All right. Yes. On my days off. Yeah, you, yes. A couple of days off. Um, so 29. <laughs> when I was when I was 29, 29, what's the number? 29. I, I lived in Singapore when I was 29. It was very hot in Singapore. Nice. It's, uh, very nice. Yeah, it was an interesting experience. I remember, I think I arrived when I was, yeah, probably around 29 exactly, actually, 28. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I got there, um, yeah, it was a shock to the system. It was uh, it was 30 degrees Celsius every day, all day. Uh, and you mm -hmm. were able to walk around in flip-flops all the time. Uh, loved the place, moved on uh, when I was 30, 31. So that's my story about 29. Thank you so much for bearing with me on that. So <laughs> <laughs> on the housekeeping side, well, we had a great SlaterCon remote yesterday and we're going to talk about it soon. Uh, we also have our digital marketing webinar coming up. There's literally like, I think we have, we're at 400 participants now. Um, so it's uh, it, it's, a, it's already a big success. So go and, and head over there and sign up for that digital marketing webinar. And then we're going to announce a new SlaterCon remote soon. Um, you know, SlaterCon remote, I don't know, September, October, uh, with the other SlaterCons, you always call it SlaterCon London, SlaterCon San Francisco, etc. But this time, of course, we do not have a location. So the agenda today, first, we're going to talk about Stripe. And they ran a super interesting survey around um, uh, e-commerce and some of the biggest uh, fails and errors and, and things like that in Europe. Uh, then we're going to do a, mm -hmm. a, a quick rundown on SlaterCon remote. We're going to talk about Deluxe and their localization business. Then the biggest computational linguistic conference, ACL, took place virtually, or pro I think it's still taking place. I think it's. I think it finishes today is the last day, apparently. Today, yeah, also yeah. remote. Uh, and then uh, just briefly about Yonkers' new CEO, and then Memsource, uh, a bit more info there. We're, um, we're going to run a piece next week. So um, Stripe. Very interesting story we picked up and got a ton of traction on LinkedIn. Um, I think we're in the triple digit likes, which is um, which is nice. Very nice. So basically, they ran a, a survey around um, errors and things like that during checkout, right? I mean, you go and you buy something online. Maybe the, the website's in English or, well, in English or in, in your local uh, language, but then the actual checkout um, is in a different language or, or is, is still mm -hmm. in English, right? So they ran a customer experience uh, survey around the checkout point of the buying journey among 450 European e-commerce site, the big e European e-commerce site. And yeah. drum roll, the most common error in European e-commerce is at checkout, lack of translation. So that was very interesting. And you know it's in, it's okay if a consultancy says that or some I don't know some other smaller well, organization. some interested party I yeah suppose. some interesting party but I mean Stripe is literally the most valuable private firm at the moment I guess Silicon Valley I think I, I called it the the world's most um, valuable startup but I think I think it's Silicon Valley's most valuable startup so they just uh, recently okay. got a six a six hundred million dollar funding round which valued them at thirty six billion dollars. Um, Not bad. You know, I don't know. Deservedly so. We've been using Stripe for five years, and I love it. I remember when I enrolled, mm. uh, when we just got Slater off the ground. I was still in. It was still kind of in closed beta or something, and I had to apply, and it took yeah. me like two weeks to, you know, let me in. Uh, but now, um, you know, they're uh, well on their way. Of course, thirty-six billion. That's a lot of money or a lot of valuation. So the study was entitled "The State of European Checkouts in 2020." More than half of the customer checkouts had at least three basic errors. I mean, there was stuff like auto verify the cart number as it was entered and did not confirm the cart type when the cart number was entered. So, you know, you type in 40 whatever, and mm -hmm. then it automatically says it's a Visa card, et cetera. But again, the most common errors were that 74% of the checkouts did not have a local language translation when, quote, customers located elsewhere in Europe tried to make a purchase. And it failed to offer the most relevant payment options for international customers. And 
the laggard here was the Spanish checkouts. Uh, Stripe analyzed um, none of the Spanish checkouts that Stripe analyzed had uh, a local language in during the checkout experience. So, you know, that's it. The Spaniards. Uh, I think that the Dutch. The Dutch ones were the most uh, localized ones. So anyway, head over to, to the article and, and check it out, pun intended. <laughs> Moving on to uh, SlaterCon, SlaterCon Remote. So uh, I'll talk a bit about some of the other things I, that st stood out to me. But first, maybe can you get started with, uh, with Stuart? Yes. So, yeah, Stuart Green from Zoo. We've actually had him as a speaker before in one of our London conferences. Um, so, Stuart, very great to, very good to have him back um, speaking again. Um, um, so, just a bit about Zoo. They obviously are a media localizer. They do subtitling, dubbing. There's quite a heavy emphasis now on um, sort of the cloud, um, cloud dubbing in particular. Um, and so, he spoke about how traditional dubbing has been impacted a bit well, quite a lot during COVID, um, particularly because people weren't able to go into the studios. So a lot of recordings just didn't happen. Um, so he was telling us um, kind of about Zoo setup, really, which they've been doing long before COVID, um, kind of operating a, a remote um, cloud dubbing setup, um, where the voice artists are working from home, uh, makes it convenient for, for voice actors. Um, so he's telling us, yeah, a bit, bit about their operations. Um, for example, they have um, certain uh, microphones that they've whitelisted for the voice talent to use just to make sure that they're of a certain quality um, for the recordings. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it was interesting to hear an update really from, from somebody who's been doing cloud dubbing or remote dubbing, how, however you want to call it, for, for quite a while and, and long before kind of COVID hit. So yeah. Yeah, and just to jump in here, uh, I actually just had to mute myself because there is, you know, I moved, I'm in a new office, as people can see who watch it on YouTube, I uh, got a nice background, got everything set up, got some, um, a little bit of a soundproofing equipment here that, <laughs> that makes sure that the, that the quality is better. And they decided right before the podcast that we're going to start drilling over in um, uh, kind of opening up the road over there. So I'm, I'm haunted yeah. by construction noise wherever I go. And that's they're actually following you. They're following me. And that's something that Stuart said as well. I mean, for if you want to do remote dubbing yeah, from yeah. home, you need to have a proper studio. And this is not as easy um, as it kind of at first glance right i mean you know mm. as i'm personally struggling with finding so a quiet finding, space finding that out I think, yeah to do a podcast a <laughs> but yeah but i mean yeah. if you want to if you want to dub a you know a professional uh, or whatever feature movie or anything like that you need to have a, a very mm. proper uh, setup so it's one of the challenges and he also said that uh, uh yeah with, with the mics uh, so that the, mm -hmm. the mics got a lot better. Uh, I mean, I think we're we're finding this out as well. Maybe twenty years ago, it would have been really expensive. And these these equ yeah. this equipment has gotten better. So for and then we moved on to uh, Piotr uh, from uh, uh, Value for Capital, a private equity firm. Um, you know, we, we're not going to go too much into detail. People can check it out. Uh, th those who who registered, there's a recording available. We're going to write about it. But generally, he's very bullish on uh, on the industry. Uh, he uh, points out. Uh, some of the high, what I find interesting uh, is that he, you know, he points out the, the, the things like uh, uh, fragmentation of the market, content explosion, cross-border mm -hmm. trade. That's one of the reasons why they like the space and they invested in it. So he's coming from a private private equity background, right? Yeah, they're a private equity firm. Value for Capital, yeah. Yeah, uh, private equity firm. They invested in Suma Lingua, uh, the Polish LSP. And so... You know, uh, on the tech side, NMT side, it says, look, positive could be cost reduction, like you're you're making your, your uh, supply chain more efficient. On the negative side, you know, there's always this risk of commoditizing the business generally. Mm. Uh, yeah, we'll go into uh, into much more detail in, in our follow up coverage, of course. But it was it was really good to have a, an investor also uh, on the panel there or on, you know, on the on the speaker roster. Uh, Quill, Ed uh, Busi from uh, Quill. Yeah, so quite interesting. They uh, they're much more on the content origination trend uh, transcreation side, right? I think they mentioned mm. that translation is very rare, about five percent of their it's like less, yeah, less than five percent of the volume. So, but mm. it was interesting how they categorized it, right? Translate, localize, sorry, tra yeah, translate, localize, transcreate, and originate. So. Mm. 
uh, yeah, very interesting presentation. How they how they scale this. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, what he said there. Yeah, I mean, definitely sort of seg segmenting it, or I suppose differentiating between those service levels. I think is is helpful for customers, and particularly for customers who maybe um, are not super mature in the localization uh, model. Um, and I think origination, yeah, it, I think he was sort of saying there's, you don't necessarily, for, for origination, which is obviously creating original content, for example, you don't necessarily need a source text. That's right. You don't yeah. always need a source text, but they do need to, I can't remember how, how what words he used to phrase it, but he was sort of saying we have to agree what true and accurate is, I think, with the client. So you really need to provide them with data or a detailed brief or something which allows then Quill, the linguist, to go off and create this copy, which is going to kind of match your brand, et cetera. Yeah, um, I remember I remember that he said, like, sometimes we just get a spreadsheet, sometimes we get yeah. a brief, but obviously it needs yeah. to be quite um, quite on point for people to go off and, mm. and write something. Yeah. Yeah. That, so that, that was one thing, I think, the origination, which I think is, is something that I've heard a few people in the industry talk about, but not really on a wide scale. Mm. Um, and... Then I think talking about e-commerce more generally, so they are, Quill is specifically interested at this point in what they call performance content. So this is it, this is kind of the, the critical content that helps people online right before they make a purchase. So you might also call it conversion content. Um, uh -huh. And he was he was also saying that with it within e, so things like um, product descriptions, buying guides, optimization for marketplace and things like that. And he was saying, well, within e-commerce, that generally for localization, um, the uh, awareness level, awareness raising for customers is pretty well served. So things like uh, ads and TV content is is really well served, I think, with, within the localization space. Um, but really within conversion level, there's kind of less attention being paid to that. So I, I think that's where their, their kind of niche focus is at this point. Very good. Yeah, exactly. It's, um, it's, they tailored it very nicely. So um, yeah. we should go back to, to the presentation. Uh, yeah. When we're I mean, they, the actually, they actually, we, we featured quill within our travel and retail report that we published last year so yeah. we, we did sort of include some of this kind of um yeah some of these ideas within there as well and then we had, helpful. next one we had our Anne carlisle um from the uh chartered incentive linguists and and she was really making the case for um also certifying uh your skills as a as a as a, as a linguist as a translator and mm. um and and also kind of valuing the the human component in, in translation of course because you know we've we've, we've mm. also said that you know as nmt gets better and better actually the expertise level of a translator and linguist needs to actually become uh you know higher and higher and higher as well because to iron out those those uh remaining issues takes a lot of expertise so i think she made that case as well um, then we had Balash from EasyLing, uh, a, a web proxy uh, localization solution. Interesting, I didn't know that 95% of their clients are LSPs, so he must have had a great mm -hmm. conference yesterday. They were, you know, we had over 300 people <laughs> there. Uh, a lot of end buyers, but also, of course, uh, uh, you know, probably 150, 200 LSP um, people. So uh, it was it was great for him. Uh, I think I'm a little not I'm not technical enough to. Uh, at this point, walk uh, walk people through, but it's basically uh, you know it's it's a, a web proxy solution for you to relatively easily host multilingual websites or display multilingual mm -hmm. websites. So it's also going into the e-commerce side of things. Uh, we also had a game localization panel with uh, you know EA and um, and uh, Frontier Development, so two game publishers uh, moderated by Daniel uh, from uh, Loquatix, a consultancy firm for the game lock space. So also there, let's wait for the, the write-up. Uh, lots of good insights uh, on that side. And then finally, let's close on David Edwards from Pipedrive, uh, a CRM kind of sales SaaS solution. Apparently yeah. they raised about $90 million so far. Uh, they have, uh, they're based in Estonia. So, you know, kind of a country that has a very techy reputation. Uh, building up the lock team, have five lock team members, two internal translators for Portuguese and German, which apparently are their top two languages. Uh, they're doing about two million words a, a, a year now, 14 languages. They outsource. Um, now, what I found fascinating is just one one key, key point here that I, I'd like to share is 
they used vendors, LSPs from outside of Estonia, like global vendors or yeah. in other areas. And and it just didn't work well. Like the, the communication was not great. Lines of communication is what he said. So they actually chose a, a vendor from Estonia. And, you know, I think to me, we made this point before, it really drives mm. home the point that this industry, despite its super cross-border virtual nature, actually sometimes really comes down to having, you know, your your vendor in, in the geography that you're in, in the country that you're in, and that you're very culturally yeah. close. You know, for, for a solution like Pipedrive, you wouldn't assume that, like, you need particular local Estonian knowledge. I mean, I, I would assume that their Estonian sales are very small, but still, <laughs> you... You want to have your vendor very close. You want to maybe meet with them. You want to make sure that the lines of communications are very much open. So I find it fascinating. A company like this, tech, uh, SaaS, still chooses a vendor that's from that the country they're based in. You know, for what it's yeah. worth, I think it's a it's an interesting um, it's an interesting point. Moving on, media localization, uh, deluxe. What happened there? Yeah, back again to media localization. Um, so deluxe is a, well, is, was, I don't know, a long time major global player in uh, media localization, but also on um, sort of post-production and distribution side. So they're US based um, and part of their business now has just been sold or is being sold, I think, to private equity. Um, and that includes the localization part. So the part that's being sold is the localization, so the subtitling and dubbing part, um, along with digital cinema, home entertainment, and fulfillment operations, they've said, um, but not the creative part of the business. So but you said was or is. Why is that? Well, because it's being chopped up, isn't it? So yeah, I don't the, know if you can refer to it in the present. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, okay. Because the bankruptcy, it, right? So they, chapter 11. Well, and also, yeah. Yeah, and also the part that's not being sold is going to be renamed. It's going to be so, renamed? Okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, presumably the deluxe name will continue with the part that has been sold, but I, I don't know about that. Um, yeah, they had some. They yes. had a new logo. I mean, I checked it out on uh, when I researched oh, okay. it. I think they had a... But I think it's called... Let me just pull this up here. Um, I think it's called... Where is it? Yeah, it's this call. It's called Deluxe Localization. Like they have a new logo oh, okay. and everything. But I think that it really is, again, a sub part of the part that was sold yeah, off now. Sold off. Anyway, yeah. so. Yeah, so uh, I think it sounds yeah. like Deluxe will, they will keep, that part of the business will keep the Deluxe name. Um, exactly. But yeah, so they were sold to Platinum Equity, which is a California um, based private equity firm. Um, no financial terms were disclosed. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you mentioned there the, the Chapter 11 bankruptcy. So what happened was last year, 2019, I think around I think it was like September or October time, um, Deluxe filed for a Chapter 11 bankruptcy. So, I mean, the business has obviously sort of hit some rocky times at that point. Um, not unusual for people, for companies that were focusing on sort of the traditional Hollywood studios and the linear TV and the sort of physical distribution channels. I was going to mention that, physical um, distribution, DVD. Um. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And we've spoken about that, I think, yeah. many times before um, of the sort of difficulty for a lot of traditional vendors in that space to really adapt to um, the OTT landscape, um, you know, the streaming giants like Netflix, etc. And the demands that that and challenges that that has brought on the supplier landscape. Let me ask you a um, question, chapter, just briefly yeah, to interject no. here. OTT, yeah. I understand it means over the top. But actually, yeah. I got to be honest, I have no idea why, it, why, what is over the top. So... So as I understand it, it's because it goes over the top of um, like TV channels. So it bypasses like the Kate, the kind of network cables. Okay. So it's like a, it, it cause you're, you don't, you don't need like a, yeah, TV or TV license or. We shall yeah. investigate. I, I did used to have a, a good answer for this and I did think about it recently, but I've, I've actually sort of forgotten the kind of, yeah, the logic behind it. But it is something to do that it goes, ba it's basically direct to customer and you bypass the original, sort of the, the traditional setup of a TV wiring and things like that. Okay, yeah, it makes sense because you can watch, I mean, it doesn't matter okay. if I consume it on the phone, the laptop or, or well, plug it into the TV, right? Um yeah. Yeah, because there's so many acronyms we're throwing around, and DOTT sometimes I'm not even sure about. So okay, now learn something. Yeah. Um, ish, yeah. <laughs> ish. 
<laughs> um, but yeah, anyway, just back to the chapter 11. I mean, um, so that that form of bankruptcy is used really when, co- when companies want to continue operating. So it allows businesses to keep operating while they also work out how to, for example, re- reorganize their debt and assets. Um, yeah. So we kind of knew that something was on the cards when they filed for bankruptcy, but obviously now it's emerged that it has been sold off to Platinum Equity. Got it. Um, there you go. All right, let's move to a very different topic. Today we're kind of going through a bunch of topics, but anyway, um, yeah. let's let's do that. Let's go to another uh, area of the language. Well, it's not the industry; it's academia. So, uh, mm. as we mentioned, the um, ACL, the Association of Computational Linguistics. Yeah, that's correct. Wow, I uh, I got that right. Um, is having their conference right now. It's virtually July 5th to 10th. Um, Originally was scheduled to be in Seattle, Washington, right? Moved online Mm -hmm. because like everything else moves online. Um, So yeah, there was, they had a ton of submissions and now they just selected the top three papers. So one paper involving MT was runner up, right? Yes. (laughs) So this this is an honorable mention, that one, yeah. How many submissions uh, so did they? Sorry, how many submissions they had, did they have? Yeah, they had over three thousand submissions overall, um, but then not all of them were accepted. So the way it works, you submit a paper and then you have to have it accepted. Okay, and it's like um, seven hundred so, or something were accepted, maybe less. I well, don't know. I said, oh, with the was it long and short papers together, just over a quarter were over accepted. A quarter. Okay, yeah, right. um, and then yeah, from there, then obviously the panel, the committee decided on. Um, the best overall paper and two honourable mentions. So we'll talk about one of those honourable mentions, as you as as you mentioned, <laughs> was um, a paper that was focused on machine translation and specifically um, blue or blur. So tangled up in blue, blue reevaluating the evaluation of automatic machine translation evaluation metrics. There's a lot of words That's a in mouthful. there. A lot of a lot of evaluation evaluating. Um, is that if I'm actually was, reading this now? Did they? Is that a? Yeah. Is that a? They've done it on purpose. They've they 100% done it on purpose, done it on right? Purpose. Yeah. I, 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 and I've been noticing a lot of these papers now have like slightly kind of like snappier or like titles that there's some kind of like amusing twist. Like yeah, it's the, the other one that had it's clickbait. Yeah, clickbait the in academia. That, the other one that the other one that had an honourable mention was called or started. Don't stop pre-training. <laughs> like, don't stop believing. And the other one. I know the other one is kind of like pretty straight laced, I suppose. But, but that yeah. one, you're right. Yeah, tangle up in blue, reevaluating the evaluation of automatic machine translation evaluation. But yeah, they, they did that on purpose. So. Uh huh. I guess blue. It's good for, at least you know, yeah, we had a blue, we had blue discussions before. I mean, I'm. I yeah. guess my position has only hardened since you cannot mathematically evaluate language. Mm-hmm. I think I'm going out on a limb here, um, especially now that we've reached a certain level. It just, well, I mean, yeah. show me something well, I mean, they that said, works. They said much the same, didn't they? They've said much yeah. the same. I mean, I haven't, I didn't write this piece, so I haven't read their paper in much detail at all. But I mean, they've they've said that the current methods for judging metrics are highly sensitive to the translations used for assessment, particularly the presence of outliers, which leads to or often leads to falsely confident conclusions about a metric's efficacy. So basically. Outliers can sway, uh, you know, how, how, how this thing is interpreted. Um, and basically, they, I think they conclude it was time to retire blue. And they said there's nothing better than human translation. Human translators or human professional evaluators, sorry, when it comes to evaluating machine translation. No kidding. <laughs> yeah. Well, who else would that it be? That was the one thing I did pick up on when I was practicing. <laughs> All right. But, well. I mean, it goes back to the discussion. I'll just... I'll, I'll, end on this but um yeah super expensive right to have humans evaluate machine translation tough luck uh, on a lot on a large scale but probably even more expensive to have bad content put out there that uh you know i don't know gets you into legal trouble or something i don't i just find it fascinating no i think no we've doubt. reached we've reached that point where mt has gotten to the i mean you can't mathematically evaluate this and they're trying and i mean every paper i'm reading now they're still using blue whatever it is they're mm-hmm. using blue so yeah, I know. There's on the one hand the academic community is saying you know don't use it anymore. It's 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 no longer relevant. On the other hand, every single paper I'm reading about MT well, uses. Blue. It's also self 
it's self-perpetuating, isn't it? Because you want to show that your model is better or ha- how it's improved on previous models. So if the previous models are using Blur, then you also have to use Blur or somehow convert everything to yeah. a different metric. They're stuck. Anyways, moving on. Um, Yonkers, a, uh, you know, I think well-known brand name in the language industry has a new CEO that's... Uh, Silke Schweigert from, I mean, she used to be from uh, SDL and they hired her, mm-hmm. or she joined late last year and uh, she was the chief revenue officer and now she's been appointed to CEO. Talking about machine translation, they have a, a pretty uh, sophisticated uh, tool they've launched last year called Word, Words Online. And um, it's mm-hmm. also kind of interacting with uh, with MT high volume translation. So she mentioned that this was uh, this was one of her focus um, in, in her time as CRO, but also now they're really trying to push this. So new CEO at Yonkers, we're, I think we just published the article uh, a couple of minutes ago. And then Memsource, mm-hmm. Uh, we did manage to publish our story this week. Uh, we just got so much good, um, um, well, not content, but we, we did two interviews with, uh, with well, one with the, the Fernando uh, Chueca, the, the private equity uh, partner that invested, and then also with David Chanek, the CEO of Memsource. So uh, mm-hmm. it's a lot of material and we're going through it and I hope we're going to be publishing it on Monday or Tuesday. Uh, very exciting. Um, I'm, I'm actually really excited about this piece. I think it's a, it's a, not a, mm. as I said, not a fully transformative acquisition, but it's just it's something that we haven't seen for a while now that a, a TMS uh, system yeah. has been acquired or funded to the to the to the level that that Memsource has. And in terms of the valuation, I think we can now more or less confidently say this: it's somewhere between forty and fifty million dollars that this transaction values okay. Memsource at. So four to five times revenue. And that's uh, that's quite high. That's uh, quite quite mm-hmm. a high um, quite a high valuation. I mean, obviously, it's a SaaS tool, recurring subscription. So uh, that's what uh, investors like. Um, and uh, again, watch out next week. We're we're, we're going to be covering it in, in great detail, and I think we will be able to shed a lot of light on that transaction. Uh, very exciting. So yeah. That closes it for today. I think we're going to be able to announce Slatercon remote dates in the, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, you know, for once, we don't have Very to cool. deal with hotels and locations. Uh, so, mm. and the tech worked. I mean, we, you know, we used to go to webinar. That was really good. It was okay. I mean, there's a, a million more advanced or kind of more, not more advanced, but like, I mean, go to webinar is, is kind of the traditional solution for that, but it worked yeah. very well. I mean, we had zero glitches, handovers were smooth. So I liked it. Using it again. Me cool. Too. That's it. Thank you very much and right. goodbye. Thanks. Bye.